Welcome to Passing the Plate, the podcast that's all about food, traditions, and the incredible connections they create. I'm Ashley Covelli, the food writer and recipe developer behind Big Flavors from a Tiny Kitchen. And I'm Lisa Listen, the genealogist and family history expert behind Are You My Cousin? We are your guides on this flavor-packed adventure. We're not just talking about recipes. We're diving into family history, exploring new cultures, and preserving favorite recipes for future generations. In short, we're celebrating the stories and tastes that come with every bite. So grab a seat at the table and let's head out on a journey of flavor, tradition, and connection. This is Passing the Plate, where every episode is a feast for the senses and a celebration of togetherness. We're finishing up our series that explores the five taste buds with a live taste testing of our last two flavors. So Lisa, I feel like in our last episode, it was a little more traditional ingredients because we had sweet, salty, and bitter. Um, This assortment of ingredients is a little more intense, (laughs) a little different, (laughs) um, because we're going to be exploring uh, sour and umami. So if you're playing along at home or if you want to grab some items that fit those categories from your own kitchen you can go ahead and hit pause or we'll put the list in the show notes but today you'll want to grab something to cleanse your palate in between we're both doing club soda just unflavored just something to get the taste of one thing out of your mouth (laughs) to move on to the next um we're doing well i have a grapefruit lisa's i think didn't pan out yeah well i'll I'll fill you in on that one later (laughs) (laughs) um we have some dill pickles Balsamic vinegar. Now the next two, uh, the next two are a little different. Stick with me. MSG, which I actually mailed some to Lisa because she didn't have any, and it's like, what well, if you don't use it? Why bother? Um, it's not as scary as it sounds. It's we'll get there later, but it's uh, a seasoning that you can get. And then I found this other spice blend. Um, it's from Burlap and Barrel and Bon Appetit. It's called the Umami Blend. Obviously, if you don't have this, don't worry about it. If you're curious about it, I'll leave a link in the show notes. It's been great. I've been using it a lot, and I'm excited for Lisa to try it. Um, I mailed her little bags bags containing part of some of my spices. They're so cute. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, I think I used, like, pill bags. Like, you buy them to put, like, travel pills. <laughs> um, then we have shiitake mushroom and tomato paste. So quite the assortment today. Definitely. I'm actually really looking forward to this. Um, I actually like sour things, so Mm -hmm. I'm good with that. The um, umami is really, I know that I've had these, some of these things, but I've never really thought about it from that type of flavor angle. And so Mm -hmm. it's not a a flavor palette that I really know a lot about or have had a tremendous experience. So I'm really looking forward to doing that and kind of hearing a little bit more about your experience and your knowledge about how to, you know, use these in recipes and and what they can do for foods. Mm -hmm. So, well, before we get to umami, we'll start with sour. Yes. My favorite. So, so, um, are we going to start with the pickles? We can. Or should, or do you want to go talk about your grapefruit incident? (laughs) Oh, either way, which would you prefer? Which would you um, like to start with? You want to, you start with the grapefruit incident all right. if you want. So I'm going to eat some grapefruit while and Lisa observes. I'm going to actually watch her eat a grapefruit. <laughs> Not, a whole, Not, Not a, a whole one. Not a whole one. So, yes, I actually love grapefruits. They are sour. And mm. I actually had had one in the refrigerator and I cut into it and it was bad. Unfortunately, mm. so that one I was like, well, that's not going to work. I'll just have to let... See what Ashley thinks about her sour. I do like sour things a lot. I, I truly, truly like grapefruits and grapefruit flavorings. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, in our earlier episode where we talked about, you know, being a super taster or not, some people who are more sensitive to taste, you know, sour is one that's a little too intense. A grapefruit can be too intense for a super taster. For sure. But definitely not my experience. So what about you, Ashley? How do how do you like grapefruits? I love grapefruit. Um, ah. I definitely didn't used to. I think probably the first time I had it where I enjoyed it back as a kid, my grandma did the thing where you just like sprinkle a little sugar on it. And I mean, what's not to love? Right. 
especially if you get one of those grapefruit spoons with the little teeth and you kind of get in there and get that out. Uh, my son actually enjoys eating grapefruit like that without the sugar. I, I haven't told him that you could like sprinkle sugar on it because why bother? He likes it as it is. Um, but yeah, I, I find grapefruit, it's, I mean, when you cut it, it's the aroma is so like potent. It's like, it's so refreshing and it's just different than like an orange or other types of citrus I find. And you get the sweetness, but then you're definitely left with bitter after so yeah, yes. I guess that's kind of sour and bitter, right? I think so. I think it, to me it's more sour. Like a crossover. Mm -hmm. um, it can be bitter when you get into some of the pith, mm -hmm. you know, around the white part around it, if that's part of it. But I think overall it's that sourness, I guess, that I like. And I kind of wonder if growing up, because I had the same thing. Like we'd had grapefruit, you know, I could put some sugar on it, even cinnamon with it. Oh. But I, I wonder... If it kind of made it harder for me to, or delayed my really liking it as a pure fruit, oh, because it was sweet. And so if you put a little sugar on your grapefruit and then your next piece doesn't have a whole lot, right? you know, it just intensifies that sourness of it. So I almost wonder if, you know, growing up, if that was kind of what delayed me from actually really enjoying it as a mm. fruit. Yeah, um, maybe. A regular. So. I do um, also like... With any citrus, really, but just like squeezing a little bit in water or seltzer just to give it like a little flavor, but you're not adding sweetness to it. Mm. Um, but it's also, it's great in salads. I have, speaking of like bitter and digestive ingredients, I have a salad recipe that uses fennel, like you, which is another ingredient it took me a very long time to come around to, but it pairs fennel and grapefruit. Um, it's really nice. And oh, sometimes a dressing good. with something like that, you do want to add a little sweetness, either with like honey or maple syrup or something. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm that a big fan. Nice. I understand why people aren't, but I very much enjoy grapefruit. And apparently if you have um, kidney issues, like any mm -hmm. like uh, any sort of kidney disease or um, it's grapefruit is bad. You're supposed to avoid it. I think it messes with the medication or something. I was going to say grapefruits actually can interact with medications. Mm -hmm. And so definitely um, the people have to pay attention to that. Yeah, um, which you would think it's a fruit. Like why would, you know, it's just, it's, it seems counterintuitive that a natural food like that would potentially cause a problem. So definitely look into that if you're. Oh yeah. If your doctor yeah. tells you not to eat them, do not eat them. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, the other thing that we're going to taste, which is sour, is your classic dill pickle. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, I love dill pickles. I've loved them since I was little. And we would get them. We'd go to the North Carolina State Fair, and you had the Mount Olive Pickle Factory was there. Oh, is that where, where Mount Olive Pickles is from? Oh, yeah. yeah I see North them at Carolina. the store. I didn't know that's where yeah. they're from. Oh. Absolutely. So they would have their pickle booth there. Not a pickle booth. They no longer have it there. I, for, I was there for the last. It would have been. I can't remember how many years. That may have been pre-COVID, but it was a very sad day when they opened the fair and there was no pickle booth. Yeah. But they would have pickles <laughs> there and they would, you could, they had different ones you could sample. And then you, we would always get these really gigantic kosher deals. That was a big mm -hmm. thing. We could always get, you know, that. So, you know, all the kids are getting candy apples. I'm getting like the big old kosher deal pickle. Oh, and you would great. eat on it, you know, for the whole thing. And it was so sour. And it was so delicious. But they also had a thing where you had to guess how many pickles were in the jar. And they said they would have this gigantic jar, you know, filled with pickles. And you had to guess every year. And of course, we always guessed, you know, and of course, number one. Well, <laughs> my husband guessed, and my husband guessed the exact number of pickles. Wow. And he won a case of pickles. Wow. It was, it was thrilling. It was like a really, it was so, we were so excited. So we had a whole case of pickles. That's fantastic. I, so we love pickles. Our farmer's market has a lot of, there's a couple different pickle vendors at the various farmer's markets in my area. And they always have like, I mean, aside from pickled cucumbers in different varieties, like a full sour, a half sour, um, they have lots of different types like that, but they also have pickled garlic and pickled peppers and pickled cauliflower like all sorts of different things so I'm a big fan of that and when my son was younger we would go and you could pay a dollar for a pickle on a stick and they would take from the bin of full pickles and you could get whichever type you want uh, they put a popsicle stick in it and you walk around like 
like a popsicle, but it's a pickle. That's so, oh, that's so cute. Right? I love that. I had never heard of half sours until you mentioned it. Yeah. I grew up, so my um, my grandmother and my mother would make pickles. So this was mm. very common. People would, you know, make their pickles. Grow a lot of cucumbers down here. And uh, I can remember going to the farmers, you know, to get the pickles or to get the cucumbers that they wanted to do. And then I can remember being at my grandparents and she, my mom and my grandmother would be making pickles and you'd have these crocks of pickles and they have to mm. sit different time periods for different, I don't know what they do because I've never made the pickles, but yeah. they would have to sit. I can just remember these big crocks. And then I remember them, you know, putting them in jars and, and waiting for, to hear the jars pop. Mm-hmm. Because if the jar, they canned them. And so if you heard a pop, you knew that they were okay. <laughs> they were sealed. That was kind of my job. <laughs> yeah. Listen to the pops. Well, and speaking of jars of pickles, the pickle jars are notoriously a little tricky to open. So aside from those little like grippy things you can use to twist the top, I saw something mm, a couple years ago. If you take a butter knife under the rim of the pickle jar lid, gosh, how can you describe this? You take the tip of the butter knife and you put it kind of in between where like the kind of teeth of the lid are and Mm -hmm. you just like push it a little bit out away from the jar it'll pop right open yeah yeah you just pop it yeah i do that so i'm dating myself um so a little piece of family history in my my kitchen is a bottle opener jar opener that my grandfather would give out to his customers he owned a an ice and coal company in greensboro north carolina many many years ago and these things still exist within our family i don't know where (laughs) anybody else has it but it was a but the jar opener as in the jar like when you would open a can- something that oh, can, uh-huh. so you take off the ring and then you'd have to pop that yeah, uh, the lid. The flat piece, the mm-hmm. lid. And so that's what this was for. And so I actually use it to do exactly what you're saying. Interesting. Is to pop that seal because mm-hmm. um, I struggle getting um, yeah. twisting. That's I struggle with that. And so, yeah, I just pop the seal on jars. I still there, use that thing today. I think has got, I think's probably older than I am. There's um, um on my can opener, there's a little like it's I think it's like a bottle opener, like for bottle caps, but you can use that also. It's just kind of like a hook and you hook it right mm-hmm. underneath the yeah, lid and, and it pops theory. it open. But yeah, because I mean, there's been all sorts of things like uh, bang the lid upside down and all this stuff. And I feel like there's just a lot of crazy ways that you could probably break some glass and injure yourself trying to open these things. <laughs> this is true. This is true. But all speaking right. of pickles. Yes. So I'm doing this classic dill pickle. Dill pickle chili. Yep. Yes. Mm-hmm. That is that, so good. That also just makes me want a burger. Like, because uh, I did a pickle chip instead of like a spear or something. And yeah. Oh. Uh, so I've I did been, a spear. Oh, okay. My my favorite pickle snack is me and my mom used to make them. I still do them sometimes for lunch or snacks or whatever. Uh, pickle treats, and it's just a piece of ham, and you spread cream cheese on it, and then you roll up a dill pickle in it. And I've gotten lazier with it over the years, and I just do the um, the sandwich slices, the real thin ones, and I put that in. And I just like fold it over, so it's almost like a taco shape. Um, because I used to, I used to pat the ham dry so that the cream cheese wouldn't slide all over the place. But now I'm just like, I yeah, just throw it in there, and <laughs> it's a, it's a really you get the like creamy, the salty, the, um, the cured meat. It's just a, it's a good. Combo. And it's interesting you say the salty here because when I have this pickle, mm-hmm. it's like I want something salty with it. You need Which a little piece of ham. It's interesting, you know, and I'm thinking, I was actually thinking potato chip. But oh, <laughs> so yeah. yeah. But you're right. But when you said the, that, and I th- so I was thinking, okay, it's probably just an association because, you mm. know, you have a hamburger, you know, and a chip and a double. Right. But it makes me wonder if there's something there that with this sour taste, mm-hmm. that you crave what a little is it salt? that makes me crave a little salt to mm. go with that? I'm just curious. And I saw something yesterday that I thought was really interesting. Somebody uh, put dill pickle chips in their dehydrator for like three days. Oh. Um, and then they ground it up to make a dill pickle spice. And you can mix it with salt and they tossed it on french fries. And I've had dill pickle potato chips I love. So I'm thinking, oh, that's how I bet they do it. It's how they make like a, they make like a dill pickle salt. By drying out the dill pickles, grinding them up, mixing it with salt, and so I was like, "Oh, all right, that's your when, that is your task is to 
experiment I think with that. Maybe look. that'll be the excuse to buy a giant jar of pickles from the wholesale club because I feel like you would need a lot to grind it down into. I would, you know, yeah, because that could get pricey. <laughs> mm, yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> it's it's a it would be a fun thing to do that fun activity. Are you stuck in a cooking rut? Let's spice things up. If you're tired of cooking the same things over and over again and feel like things have gotten a little bit stale in the kitchen, I have the perfect resource for you. Let me help spark some creativity in your kitchen with Spice Up Your Life, a free guide that I've created that's packed with over 25 ideas for you to try out. Turn to this choose-your-own-adventure style guide whenever you're looking to add a little excitement to mealtime. To download your copy of Spice Up Your Life, head to bigflavors.co slash spice. All right, so we've got our um, sour out of the way. We're going to go on to the most elusive of the spices next, or the not the spices, sorry, the flavors, and that's umami. And so at, we talked about this um, on our Super Tasters episode, but um, on Ancestry.com in the traits section, it says umami is the elusive fifth flavor associated with savory foods like meaty broth and seaweed. And... Um, It talks about foods with strong umami flavor usually contain a lot of the amino acid glutamate, and that's a part of monosodium glutamate, which is MSG. But there are natural ways to get MSG, like seaweed, fish sauce, soy sauce, and Vegemite, which I've not tried. It's not that I wouldn't try it. I just I don't want to buy a whole container of it. You know, I think it would be difficult. No, I've never tried it, but I think. I would need to go to a specialty store to find it. I yeah. think it would just be really expensive. And so they, I'm not really quite willing to to spend we, the pricing for it yet. We have a British um, store in a couple towns over from me over in Mount Kisco that's got a lot of specialty like British food items. Um, but, yeah, I don't want to buy a whole jar of it because I have no idea if I'm going to like it. Right. Uh, but now here's my uh, Internet research disclaimer. <laughs> I was trying to look up how to describe the flavor of umami because, again, I'm not necessarily the best with articulating the, the descriptions of these things. So Food52 says, The elusive flavor behind everything from savory broths to aged cheeses, meaty, savory, rich, salty, and even charred are words that people use to describe umami. So I look forward to trying that and seeing it. Yeah. <laughs> So there's definitely, I think we'll start with the um, mushrooms, maybe? Shiitake? sure. Shiitake mushroom. I find, in my opinion, shiitakes are the most, like, meaty flavored, especially when you saute them. I'm just having it raw, but I feel like maybe I should have sauteed it. I'm just having it raw, too. And you're right. It's just that, it's definitely a meatier. And, like, the texture. Mm. Hmm. I do love mushrooms, though. I like that. It definitely has that kind, that meaty, that meat, that, that meaty taste that you that it mentions. But there's like a. I'm trying to figure out what the secondary. It's kind almost of, like smoky a little bit. Smoky. Are you getting that's that? That's what I'm tasting. Yes. I that's would have what never thought a raw mushroom would taste smoky. Is I mean, it's not that charred flavor that. No, but it's definitely quoting, like. But it's like it's yes. been near a grill. Yeah. Exactly, and I. Th- you know, and may, maybe part of that is the textural experience, too, that's true. that kind of triggers. And I think that's all part, but I think that's all part of it. So maybe not classically part of taste. I think still the texture plays into our experience, which can, you know, affect how we're tasting. Mm-hmm. Mm. I and I, more of I don't know how often I've done raw shiitakes. I usually do saute them. How do you saute them? Just in a little, you could use butter or olive oil. I like to... um I find I think they pair nicely with like maybe do a little garlic and shallot and some shiitakes and then um, asparagus or green beans maybe Ooh. would be nice. Oh yeah, and that the flavor of this is staying with me longer than the flavor of anything else that we've done in this. I was series. thinking the same thing as we were talking. Mm-hmm. I was like, I've still got that flavor, and it it almost intensifies a little bit more. Yeah, interesting. As, as, that's interesting. I like that. I wonder if all of the things will intensify like that, or if it's just going to be. Just gonna because be that. It, it, I wonder if that's part of that umami mm-hmm. experience. Hmm. Um, so we have one, two, three. We have four other umami things. Oh gracious! Where do you we where do you want to go? Count on umami, didn't we? Well, um, I feel like it's the hardest to describe. So it, having a variety of ways to kind of mm-hmm. get that. 
Um, Let's maybe try the, the soy sauce. I mean, not the soy sauce, the... Um, balsamic? Balsamic vinegar. Mm-hmm. I'm just doing like a regular balsamic vinegar, not an aged one, because those are going to be... That's what I did. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those a lot the of times aged are very different. I've tried the, the aged... Delicious, but like a little more yeah. s- sweet, I think. Ooh, that's probably a lot. That was intense. So the vinegar kind of hits pretty intense. Ooh! Are you okay? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> you okay with it? <laughs> yeah. Um, it was kind of nice with the residual mushroom flavor, honestly. Yeah, it really is. Because and I did, mm-hmm. I did try to cleanse the palate, but that mushroom was so strong; it's yeah. still there. And you wouldn't think a mushroom—that's so wild. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this obviously, I, if you're eating plain vinegar, it's uh, it'll hit you. I, I like it, but it's almost—I can't. It's more of that vinegary taste well, to it. I, it. I mean, it is vinegar, it's obviously. Vinegar. But it's, uh, <laughs> okay. Gotcha. I was trying to kind of get that smokiness to it. I think there's a little bit of smoky, but maybe I'm not, not as much as I thought I would. Yeah. I, well, have you ever been to one of those, um, like vinegar, oil and vinegar tap rooms where mm-hmm. you can go around? Yeah. So I, the first time I saw one, I was in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania for a wedding a million years ago. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. And they have the little sample cups. And I'm like, I'm going to taste every single one of these oils and vinegars. And who did I have to tap out? Cause it's, it's exhausting on your palate to, to have, this intense of a flavor so many times. It um, is. And it's impossible to really cleanse. Between yeah. Those. Yeah. And I think that's something, I think that's something we're going to kind of notice today yeah. as we get through. <laughs> I'm almost thinking instead of the club soda, if we had had, I almost feel like I need like a bread, like a, a, a oh, like a French or a plain bread cracker to, or something. Yeah. To really be able to just kind of cut that's some true. of that acidic. Because it's there. Learn it's, from our experiments. But it's Get delicious. yourself some bread. I'm not going to say it's not delicious. It really is. Um, you know, and I think about that, you know, I'm like, I can only imagine what my ancestors would, you know, mm. what a shiitake mushroom is. And I'm like, huh, what? <laughs> so I would say my two favorite ways, other than just like splashed on with some oil and on a salad, my two favorite ways to use balsamic are in a creamy balsamic vinaigrette. Mm-hmm. Um, that's like really delicious. And then you have some other things to kind of cut the acidity of that. And then I have a balsamic marinated pork tenderloin that I actually, I did one of the help out future me things recently and I made two and I froze one. And so we were able to have that, uh, leftover, just pull out of the freezer and, and, and heat it up. Um, it's, it's a really easy marinade. It's got balsamic and soy sauce, a little Worcestershire, um, and then you can use, you cook it in with the, the marinade and you can then drizzle that cooked liquid on top of, we do it like with rice and beans. It's mm-hmm. so good. And it's like, yeah, it's like tangy. And then you get the meatiness from the pork tenderloin. Uh, it's a great, oh, that sounds great good. combo. Mm-hmm. Have you ever, I, one thing that I like with the aged balsamic, so this mm-hmm. is more from the, in our bottle that came directly from Italy, it's aged balsamic, is to put it just a little bit and take much. Just a little bit on vanilla ice cream. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. That is amazing. It's like yeah. that. So you've got that kind of umami flavoring with that something very sweet. And it mm-hmm. really pairs well. It really brings out it brings out the flavors of both yeah. so much more intensely. We used to do that with, there was a, um, a fig balsamic, an aged fig balsamic that I would get from this place in Grand Central. And, uh, yeah, that was great with ice cream because you have also like the little bit of fruit notes too Mm -hmm. yeah all right i'm thinking tomato paste next let's go for it now so i my tomato paste is from a tube i like buying them in the tube it's like a toothpaste tube Uh Uh, and what i get is because then you can use as much as you need as opposed to those cans where it's like you feel like you're wasting Mm -hmm. if you don't use the whole thing but the, the tubes usually say double concentrate so, just as a note. Mm. So, mine's from the can. It's actually, actually, I freeze it. So, I actually freeze them mm-hmm. in little mm-hmm. things. And so, it's, it tastes like an intense tomato. We t- I can't say I would have ever described this as an umami. I wouldn't have had that word, I guess, for it. But it, when you mentioned this as being part of that umami flavor palette, I'm like, mm. <laughs> yeah. But I guess I, will- I, I do kind of see it. I've never had, I've never eaten this plain before. I've always had it in things. But I will yeah. say, like, when I make fajitas, 
I'll add when it's when it's mostly cooked, I'll add a little tomato paste and stir it around and it gets kind of like toasted and mixed in with everything. And it does really like make the flavor of everything a little more rich. You know, I've had your fajita recipe and I've done mm. that. And yeah. And I remember thinking when I did, I thought that seems unusual. Like what's the but point? It was, yeah. But it was good, but it was good. But I was like, mm -hmm. and then I thought maybe it was to kind of thicken it a little bit, but not that it's, it needed it's to be a thickened, small, but I yeah, like, it's a small amount is, though. It, Cause it's such a small amount, but it definitely does bring that kind of, it's like that second note of richness into mm -hmm. the flavoring. Yeah. And I can, and now that as we've talked about it and we've kind of tasted these others, I can think, I, I start to kind of taste that smokiness mm -hmm. that I hadn't really, it's interesting as we've done the tsunami, that's, the, that's the word that keeps coming into smoky, my head. It's yeah. more smoky as opposed to meaty or, or rich mm -hmm. or something like that. It's that, that's the piece that keeps, pops out to me and, anyway. And I swear that mushroom is still, I'm still tasting the mushroom. Mm -hmm. I still have that Not the, the balsamic, but that, who would I... That's really surprising to me. Yeah. I'm surprised mm. as well. All right. Me too. Uh, All right. What's up next, Ashley? Besides so cleansing the palate right. once again. So let's do, I guess, straight up MSG. Go very lightly with it. So the brand that I uh, have is called Accent, and it says, wakes up food flavor. And it's just, um, well, this one is 60% less sodium than uh, less sodium than salt. Okay. S I see what it's saying. Accent flavor enhancer wakes up food flavor with 60% less sodium than salt. Accent makes meats, poultry, vegetables, soups, and salads taste even better. So it's saying like if you were just seasoning something with it to do a half a teaspoon of this per pound of meat or a half a teaspoon for each four to six servings of soups, stews, casseroles, sauces, and Sauces, salads, and vegetables. So this says salt contains 194 milligrams of sodium per 0.5 grams. And this contains 60. So that's actually good to know that this is a way to kind of, I guess, get a... Is it saying it's like instead of a salty flavor? Hmm. So it actually... It's not salt. I mean, it's not. So it brings out... But it's used to bring out flavor. So it does it have a taste on its own? We're about to find out. We I know my husband likes sprinkling a little of this on popcorn. Oh. Yeah. So I'm gonna put a little bit on my plate and then I'm gonna lick my finger and dip it in there to That's get it. That's what I was little. doing. It looks like salt. Hmm. There's that smokiness. Oh. Mm-hmm. I I really like this. I've never also I don't think I've ever tried this by itself. I I can't remember why why I bought it. I must have had a recipe that called for it. I've had it for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was very. That's. Hmm. I definitely see where you would put that on meat. That I can mm -hmm. definitely see that. And I didn't realize that that brand you mentioned that that's what that was. I mean, I've mm -hmm. seen that on the shelves. I mean. Because it doesn't announce that it's MSG. It just says accent flavor enhancer. But right. the ingredients, that's it, is monosodium glutamate. Interesting. Mm. So, yeah, I, I'm i getting... This is, I think, the most similar to the flavor of the shiitake. Yes. To me. Yes. I absolutely agree with that. And I wouldn't... It has that kind of... I wouldn't call it salty, but, like, a little. Like, it definitely tastes, like, seasoned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know that I'd put it on popcorn like your husband, though. I mean, he puts other things. He likes putting a ton of things on his popcorn. I like ah. doing just a little bit of truffle salt. That's my favorite. Um, oh, it's hard to go wrong with that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. It's funny because I feel like it's, even though, you know, drinking salts are in between, I feel like it's playing with this tomato paste, too. Still mm. in my mouth. I think it's this. I think it's the whole umami. You know, I think yeah. we probably tried to taste too many umami. Things. That's true. To be honest, I think that that's. But it was such a, a unique thing that we were interested in trying to mm -hmm. see, because it's typically when we think umami, I, I'm thinking more Asian type foods, right? But absolutely not. I mean, we use it in our everyday kitchen, and I just didn't realize that's what it was, or that mm. was the flavor palette of it. 
Wait, you use this? You use this? Spice? Not that. Oh, but oh, oh, oh. I use balsamic vinegar, the mushrooms, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, tomato paste, tomato paste pickles. Yeah. Oh, no, the pickles were something different. But, you know, that, I just didn't, I didn't really think about that. Mm-hmm. When I think of umami, I'm thinking something not typically what I, types of flavors that I have in my kitchen. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, when my husband, um, and I'm pretty sure he learned this from his dad, does like uh, marinara sauce, he will toast tomato paste and like bay leaf in the skillet first. He'll like cook it a little so he's like even enhancing more the flavor of the tomato paste and the bay leaf first before he adds the crushed tomatoes or whatever it is that he puts in that there. Makes sense, actually. So yeah. it's like it's already a concentrated thicker flavor and then you're like getting it even more you're just like building layers of flavor, really. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. Nice. All right. So last up in our umami overload <laughs> part two. Um, We're gonna have to rename the episode yeah. <laughs> Umami Overload. <laughs> this is this is a spice blend that I and again I don't need to buy more spice blends. I have plenty, but I saw this and I I looked at the ingredients and Part of it, too, I do kind of like sometimes seeing what's in spice blends and then trying to recreate it myself. But this is from Burlap and Barrel. It's a collaboration they did with Bon Appetit. And there's three different spices that they have in this particular series. You can buy them all together or just the one. And it's the Umami blend. And the tasting notes on it says savory, warm, and pungent. And the ingredients are onion powder, sorry, onion powder, garlic powder, mineral salt, Tomato powder, which so there's a tomato mm-hmm. powder being tomatoes, an umami ingredient, smoked paprika, silk chili, black pepper, and hing, H I N G. And I, I'm forgetting what that is because I did look it up. Let me, let me re Google that. Okay, so it's the same as, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, but I have bought this once. It's an Indian ingredient, asafo. Foita, A S A F O E T I D A. Um, Wikipedia says that that is the dried latex exuded from the rhizome or tap root of several species of ferula, perennial herbs of the carrot family, produced in Iran, Afghanistan, Central Asia, Northern India, and Northwest China. Different reason, regions have different botanical sources. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Different. Yeah. Uh, Asafoetida. Asafoetida. So okay. that's what's inside, or that's what's the blend inside of here. And um, the description, it says, do you wish your food just tasted better? Enter the savory seasoning, which adds salt along with layers of umami-rich flavors like earthy onion and garlic, intense tomato and paprika, and smoky hot chili and black pepper. Shower it over cooked proteins, popcorn, rice bowls, salads, or any vegetable. It makes everything it touches taste like a better version of itself. So I've tried this. You haven't tried this yet, right? I haven't tried this. Uh Uh-uh. I haven't tried it by its... Oh, no, I did try it by itself when I first got it. Mmm... What do you think of that? Mm. I like that. It's got, it does, it has a little heat from the chili. That's it. I said, there's a kick to it. So that's mm-hmm. not the first thing. Almost that tomato-y smoky taste is the mm-hmm. first thing that I taste. And then it gets, then I get the heat, the kick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can, ooh, I and think then, I took too big of a piece there. Ooh. Mm. And then it spills. It's, it, it's, it builds. The smoky flavor, smoky taste kind of builds as, it's, as we go through. It's very layered. You definitely get like a little onion and garlic, but mm-hmm. it's not overpowering. But so. Right. And it's def- that's almost like the third thing that I taste. Mm-hmm. It's like the tomato we smoky, yep. the heat, and yep. then I get the, the garlic and onion. And onion, yeah. Um, so I've been using this. Uh, for a couple weeks now, just kind of trying it sometimes in places where I would usually use my grill seasoning recipe, um, Mm -hmm. just for something a little different. So it's been great on, I did a saute with some corn that I, you know, cut off of the cobs and asparagus and tomatoes. I was just kind of cleaning out the refrigerator (laughs) 
just like anything that, that I had. And then I did like a saute for a side dish and I like threw a little bit of that on there. It was great. I put it on some uh, chicken. Uh, I think it would be good in like as the base of a, in a vinaigrette or something like to add a little something mm-hmm. different than just oil and vinegar or oil and lemon juice. Um, yeah, but I like, exactly. it's a, it's an interesting blend and it does, it just kind of takes something that would otherwise be maybe a little plain and just gives it a little oomph and makes it a little more craveable. Yes. Yes, I absolutely agree. I like it. A little more oomph. That's what we A little more oomph. Oomph, oomph, oomph mommy. Oomph, oomph, oomph mommy, if you will. I'll call the oomph <laughs> mommy. <laughs> that is funny. Uh, so, Ashley, I'm curious. And we've tasted all of these things. And some of these we've thought that, you know, we know we didn't like certain flavors growing as little, as kid, children and growing up. And that we didn't come to t- like some of these until we were adults. Um, did you know that taste preferences and taste buds will change as you age? Interesting. Now, this is internet research again, guys, but taste buds actually decrease as we age. Oh. And our, which can cause some of our, taste, our preferences to change as well. Interesting. I, I wonder if the, does the amount of taste buds change or just their sensitivity? I think, I think the number. I think the number. Oh. Can change. So that's, I wonder if I had I even more that. than 55 per whole punch as determined on our Super Tasters test years I don't ago. Know. I, hmm. And I don't know when this actually, you know, kind of happens, but um, right. I just thought that was kind of an interesting yeah. thing um, with that. I wonder if that has anything to do with the idea. I don't know if this is actual science or just something that I've heard and have taken as scientific, <laughs> that your cells regenerate every seven years I in I your body. No so idea. I wonder if um, if every seven years you start to have things that you like or dislike that you didn't used to taste wise also. I have no idea. I do. But I do think some of it may be more experiential. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're tasting something for the first time and it's in a very, you know, you're on vacation and you're relaxed, you're really enjoying something. You have one of these dishes with a mommy flavoring or, you know, like the, the mushrooms, maybe you didn't really like mushrooms, but now that you've, you know, had this wonderful experience in tasting it, I wonder sometimes though, if that doesn't, you know, kind of color how we taste things and, that and, and true. change that taste experience for us. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just kind of curious about that because those are the kinds of things sometimes I think about, you know, if I'm just tasting it at home, I'm like, eh, not so much. Right. But, you know. Or if- similarly, if you're, if you eat something and say maybe you end up getting food poisoning or you end up being sick right after and then you have a hard time enjoying it. It's because you have that association. So how much of it is like mind over matter and how much of it mm. is actually what it tastes like? That's a good point. Yeah. Because I've had corn dog trauma more than once. So I'm <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. All right. There's a new term I haven't heard before. Corn dog trauma. Okay. <laughs> I love that. I was actually thinking more, a little more benign, but like coconut. I don't like... As much as I love sweets, I do not like coconut cake. It was my grandfather's favorite. I always made it for him. And I didn't really care for it because it would be covered in like the flaked coconut. Mm. And I really think that was a textural thing. As okay. I remember, you know, as I think back and kind of process it with adult eyes as opposed mm-hmm. to experience as a child. But I still don't really like coconut flavorings. It's like I remember that. Mm-hmm. Even though I could have something that's, you know, coconut flavored no coconut, you know, flake, and not a coconut flake in sight, but it's still kind of almost, it's like I'm anticipating it for some mm-hmm. reason. It's Interesting. Kind of how, how taste and experience play hand in hand. Mm-hmm. Anyway. All right, guys, I hope you've had as much fun with our taste test. I hope you try these at home because this is something we had an absolute blast doing the last couple episodes and would love to hear your experiences as well. So you can find the show notes for this episode at passingtheplate.org forward slash 36. That's a wrap on this episode of Passing the Plate. We hope you enjoyed our journey into the world of food, traditions, and the amazing connections they create. It's been a pleasure sharing these stories and flavors with you. Remember, food is more than just sustenance. It's a way to connect with our past, present, and future. So keep sharing your meals, keep passing those plates, and keep creating memories that will last a lifetime. Head to passingtheplate.org slash podcast for show notes.